Hello, this is a negative video. Today I'm gonna to be talking about my five least favorite books that I've read so far this year in the first six months of the year. There are people that don't don't jive with negative videos so much. I think that's fair. If that's you, I my Friday video was my top 10 best books of the year so far. I recommend that one or the next one, which is going to be a pirate recommendation video, pirate books recommendation video. If this isn't your thing, no worries. You don't have to watch this one. I'm gonna talk about five books I didn't like. Just like, oh, I already numbered them for myself. That was very nice of me. Just like with the uh, other one, I have ranked them, I have numbered them. But this time I'm going to start at five and work my way up to one. So we're gonna start with my my least passionate rant and we'll work our way up. I'll try not to, I'll try, I'll try to keep it kind of chill though. I'm gonna go grab the book because I forgot to. Coming in at number five is The Happy Place by Emily Henry. So I have read, this is my third book by her. I enjoyed People We Meet on Vacation and I really, really liked Book Nerds, Happy Place. That's this one. Buddy Reads? Book lovers! I loved it so much I forgot it. I really enjoyed the other two books of hers that I've read and I am not a romance reader. I typically don't jive with romance, but I do continually try them because I would like to be. I genuinely, I want to be a romance reader. I want to get the warm fuzzies while I watch people fall in love and live happily ever after. I'd like, what's wrong with me? So I keep trying romance books and I almost always DNF them because I just lose interest. It's not even a hatred, I just lose interest. But this was a buddy read and it was a part of my my New York Times reading vlog. So it was not, it was a buddy read and it was an essential part, well, a fourth, it was a fourth of that video. So I saw it through to the end and I hated it. I really disliked this book. Now, I said this in the New York Times video, I'll say it again. I'm not the person to be getting romance recommendations from, so take this with a grain of salt. I'm not the one to come to to see if you should pick up this book or not, but I will tell you what I thought of it. So this follows Harriet. Oh, she goes by hair, that's har, or hair or har. It follows Harriet and Wynne. So they were engaged, they were in love, they dated for eight years, they were forever. And then abruptly, Wynne broke up with her in a four minute phone call and they haven't talked again since. And then they both got invited to this couple's trip with their other best friends. There's six of them in total, six humans in total, three couples. And uh, they were gonna go separately, but because of <laughs> manipulation, they ended up both being there as a surprise because this group doesn't stop manipulating each other. Anyway, it turns out that it was an engagement thing. It turns out two, one, one of the couples, they're now engaged and they're actually getting married on this trip. And so this is our last hurrah. We're all doing this, this yearly trip. We're all doing it this one last time. So that puts Hera and Wynne in the situation where they can't, uh, tell everybody that they broke up, which they planned on doing on this trip. They now can't because they don't want to spoil the joy of this other couple, which, you know, fair enough. But now they have to play couple. They have to pretend they're dating. Anyway, this book relies so heavily on miscommunication that it's, it's, aggravating. No one's willing to talk to each other. And I said this in the New York Times vlog, I understand that it's hard to trust someone enough to be vulnerable with them and and accurate and and express to them this is what I need from you and then to trust them to honor that, to respond appropriately to that and then to do what what you need from them. I understand that, that having that sort of trust with another person to be able to be vulnerable and for them to respond appropriately is difficult because not everybody does that. So I understand that, but these are lifelong friends. These are people that go on these trips yearly. These are best, best, best friends and no one will talk to each other. No one will communicate, this is what I need at this point in my life. This is where I am at this point in my life. This is how my circumstances have changed and so, we have to respond differently. No one in this entire six piece group is willing to say anything. So what it ends up being is people getting offended over nothing like, oh, you postponed your trip? I'm gonna read into that real hard. Oh, you don't feel like going to the movie theater today? I'm going to manipulate you until you will. You don't wanna get a tattoo? Guess what? I booked an appointment and they stayed open for us and you're a bad person if you don't do it. 
She didn't say you're a bad person if you don't do it, but she did put them in. Just like little ways and big ways where emotional manipulation is the language of the day. We don't talk about our problems, we just manipulate each other. This is such a toxic friend group that I came away from it wanting every couple to break up, except Kimmy and um, Claire? What was her name? There was one couple that was acceptable. The other two couples were atrocious. I wanted everybody to break up, and I wanted the friendship group to break up too. Also, there were just these ridiculous things that would happen. Like there was one scene where a character literally said, we know about this thing you've been hiding from us because my boyfriend grabbed your boyfriend's phone and he wanted to send you a picture of himself or something, I don't know. She literally said, or something, I don't know. And then she, and then he saw the text that you two had been sending. So we know about it. So like it, what, Emily Henry didn't even bother to come up with a good reason. She just needed the plot to progress. And so she was like, I don't know, someone grabbed someone else's phone because they want for no good reason. And I don't actually know the reason. It doesn't matter. We're moving, okay? I just hated this. I hated this book. A lot of people like it. Don't just take my word for it, but I didn't. Ah, next up is The Curse of Oak Island. This one's partially on me. So I love pirates. And I read this nonfiction book that is about uh, this island where it's believed that Captain Kidd's treasure was buried and this family that is digging there. And it starts back, it starts way back at Cap Ta Captain Kidd's legend and then works its way forward throughout history of people digging holes. And, uh, and then now there's this History Channel, I think, documentary that's going on. I don't know. I have not, I, I've never seen the documentary. I don't follow anything about this. All I know is that it was supposed to be uh, what What's the tagline for this book? It's like the longest running treasure hunt in history or something like that. There was a really compelling tagline for this book. It does not reflect what the book is gonna be. It's not very interesting, but I think the thing that made me so mad about this book was how tangential it was. Is that the right word? This author goes on so many tangents. He It reads like someone who researched for a book and refused to let any of his research go unused. So we'll have this long side tangent about this college student that he, college age, college age kid who, that he hired to do some research for him. And she was late in submitting her research because she got, a, because it was a little bit daunting for her. And I reminded her, hey, I paid you in advance for this, so you gotta do it. And then she told me that she was listening to these recordings and this is why she's feeling a little bit, a little bit overwhelmed by it. And so then it's just like, oh, Really? I have to hear this story? He talked about Sir Francis Bacon for I think 500 pages. I don't think this book is even 500 pages long, but I'm pretty sure he talked about Sir Francis Bacon for 500 pages. Anything that is mildly, passively related, like a celebrity that one time showed an interest in this mystery, they're gonna be talked about. They 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 mentioned it one time in an interview. Let's talk about that interview now. It was like, it was so, it was so sad. I didn't finish this book. I DNF'd to this book. I was two thirds of the way through, maybe even three fourths of the way. I was really far into it. And I was, <laughs> what I had done was I had told, I had talked about it on my Discord at the beginning when I was excited about the book. And then uh, one someone in my Discord who reads a lot, we buddy read a lot, uh, picked it up too. And he saw it through. And I told him when I quit, I was like, I'm done, I'm out, I'm so over all these side tangents, you tell me if it's worth it in the end. And he told me it wasn't, so I'm not gonna read it. I'm not gonna finish it. My next video is all about pirate uh, books, nonfiction and fiction that I recommend. I'll give, you, I'll give you some good alternatives in that video. Oh, okay, coming in at number three, my third least favorite book that I read so far this year is The Trader's Blade. This book has really mixed reviews. Some people super love it, some people really don't. This one did not work for me. Um, for, so, so this follows the Grey Coats, um, which is this group of people that followed the king or enforced the king's law. They were kind of like the king's elite, but the king was killed, and uh, they still honor him. But essentially, their name has been drugged through the mud, and they're, the Grey Coats are no longer an honored name, a respected name. They're actually kind of mocked and looked down on, and generally, people 
don't appreciate them. So this is a, a group of people who are still trying to uh, fulfill the king's last wishes, and it's in this gritty world. I likened this to Burn Notice, if you ever used to watch that show, kind of the shtick among, in a time where there were many, many shows that were detective and uh, stories similar to, the, even this isn't a detective, the, the premise of Burn Notice was that he was a, a past spy and he's now using his past knowledge of being a spy to do a bunch of freelance work and to, I don't know, do his own thing. And the shtick in the show that made it stand out was the fact that he had all this previous knowledge and so he would kind of, there was a voiceover that would constantly explain, this is how you build this spy equipment. This is how you evade someone who's trying to follow you. This is how you do the thing. And that's kind of the vibe of the Trader's Blade, where you would have these scenes of action and the protagonist, whose name I've forgotten, would have this almost voiceover within the book where he would say, here's how you tell if someone is carrying a weapon. You have them raise their hands and then their, and then their shirt gets a little bit closer to their body so you can see an imprint of a sword if they're holding one or a knife if they're holding one. You don't want to get too close to them and frisk them. That's what a lot of people do, but now you're too close. Now you're, now it's more likely for you to be attacked. Here's how you evade poison when you think someone's trying to poison you. Here's how you do this special move that I invented that is super cool. Let me tell you about why it's so cool and how you do it. So he's a really knowledgeable person that's really excited to share his knowledge around every single corner. And that works for a lot of people. I liked it in Burn Notice. I didn't really like it in this book. There were some really great friendships in this book and really great banter between the friends. And that's kind of what carried me through to, th through it. But there's also a lot of scenes that I think are questionable at best. <laughs> Not a lot. There's probably about three scenes in this, one in particular that everybody talks about uh, that is questionable at best, but this one particular scene is, it's not even questionable. It was bad. And those couple of scenes really brought the book down for me where I was already kind of like, eh, this is a three star, it's okay. I don't know if I would continue the story. And then there were these other things that I'm like, I just don't think the author thought this through. I don't know. There, there were a lot of things that brought it down for me. A lot of people love this story again, and I'm not trying to dog anybody that loves it. I think you should love it if you do, but it super didn't work for me. Next up, coming in at number two, my second least favorite thing is a manga. It's called The Climber. I was recommended this series several times by several different people, and I understand why. The artwork is incredible. It's so beautiful. I am an adventurer, a hiker, and a rock climber. And this series is wrapped around those things. It's wrapped around rock climbing and, and its depiction of the connection. The person to the rock is so strongly illustrated. I feel that kind of feeling of just, um, of oneness with the climb is depicted so well. And my love for nature and love for discovering new places is depicted so well in this story. So I totally understand why people recommended it to me. But um, there are, I think, three different authors for this story throughout the duration of me reading it. I'm not sure if two different authors passed away or if people just started it and then abandoned it and someone else picked it up back up. But there's such whiplashing of narrative styles uh, in those, in the small section that I read, I think I read seven volumes of it before I quit. There's so much jarring changes in when you can tell that the author changed that I just didn't like, as well as some scenes that just frankly made me mad. <laughs> just like really unnecessary stuff inserted in this in this manga that I didn't appreciate and I didn't want to read. I can't show you any of the panels of the things that I didn't appreciate because it's not YouTube friendly, but I did not appreciate some things. If you love it, I think that's awesome and I think you should love it, but personally, I'm not the one. And finally, my least favorite book that I read so far this year is another DNF, and that's Ugly Love by Colleen Hoover. So I was gonna do a video this month. Uh, it was gonna be controversial books, and it was going to be coupling the New York Times vlog where I was reading books that had really high ratings that were really highly uh, being bought. You know, you understand what the New York Times list is. And I was gonna do the opposite where I was going to be, well, not the opposite, that would be books that are really hated, but I was gonna do books that had really controversial ratings. Some people love them, some people hate them. And one of the books that I was gonna do was Ugly Love by Colleen Hoover because uh, 
I don't know anything about this author. All, all I know is that uh, Book Talk seems to, seems to love her and Book Tube seems to hate her. And I've never really had any desire to check her out because it's not my genre, but I uh, figured now was the time if I was gonna do a video project like that. And I picked Ugly Love simply because that was the only one my library had. So uh, I did not like it and I ended up abandoning the video <laughs> because, because I got fatigued so quickly with the concept. That's not to say I'll never do a video like that. I still might someday, but uh, Ugly Love made me stall it at best. So we follow two characters. Uh, we have someone and someone, I don't remember their names. We have two main characters, uh, a girl who is moving back home with, or moving back, moving in with her brother. Uh, for a short period of time. And then we have her brother's best friend and also neighbor who is the love interest. And it was weird, man. It's both of their perspectives. Her perspective is present day, his is past. Present day, he's very aloof, very monotone. He doesn't show any facial expressions. He says everything in the same plain way. And so like he could be saying anything, but he delivers it like a serial killer. And then you get into his perspective and he has this very obsessive personality where he sees a girl that he's never spoken to before and he's like, you're my next girlfriend. You're my next love. Rachel, 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 you're my next love. I remember her name because he repeats it constantly. And so it's like, you might be a serial killer in present time. You might be a serial killer in past time. This is a romance book, but I think he's gonna kill someone at the end. It was very concerning to me. But anyway, he's very vulnerable and very emotionally charged in the past. And he's very emotionally removed in the present. So obviously something has happened. Um, <laughs> Some weird things happen, I'll say that. I didn't like him at all. And the situation that was presented in the past timeline, this mild spoilers, this is kind of mildly spoilery. So here's your warning now, this part's going to be mildly spoilery if you don't want it you've been warned, but it's this weird situation where he meets this girl and then I think it's the next day. Anyway, he's had one interaction with her and then his dad and her mom reveal to them that they're getting married. And so now then you have this weird dynamic where they're living in the same house and they're dating behind the scenes, like when, away from their parents. And they're like, they're, they're trying to, uh, create scenarios where they can get grounded at the same time so that they can be left home alone together, so that they can be together. And again, they just met when they found out that their parents were getting married. So this isn't like a long-standing relationship that, oh no, we have such strong feelings for each other. No, 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 that's not what's happening. Anyway, it got really weird when he got his stepsister pregnant and then we, and then, and then we're in the present timeline and they don't treat each other well. These two main characters that we're supposed to be rooting for do not treat each other well at all. They don't, she does not respect his no. Oh my goodness. She, the main, the main girl does not respect his no, but also he's like way too aggressive with her. I don't know. It's weird. I didn't finish it. I got 60% through and I couldn't, I, it wasn't for me. If you love the book, I'm glad you love the book. I know I was talking to my friend who's read several Colleen Hoover books and she was saying that one of the things that Colleen Hoover does is that she creates these very questionable, very um, morally low-key concerning scenarios and then she makes them, she makes you very emotionally invested and she takes you through a roller coaster with these situations and like that's part of the appeal is that she kind of goes there and gets you invested and I can understand the appeal of that but I can also say I'm not the one <laughs> I'm not the reader for that type of story no judgment read what you want to read but it's not me so there you go that is a quick video talking to you about the five books that I read so far this year some were dnfs some I did finish out that just were big, big, big swing and misses for me. This happens, art is subjective. Some people will like things, some people won't. These are things I didn't like. If you like them or dislike them, chat with me about them in the comments, I'd love to hear. I post videos every Monday and Friday on this channel, Tuesdays and Thursdays on my review channel, where I do weekly reading vlogs, keeping you up to date with what I'm reading, as well as dedicated spoiler reviews for some of my favorite things that, I've, that I'm reading. I'll see you again soon, bye.